Anyways, at this point, let's just assume you've had enough time to work on your quiz. <laughs> it's been 20 minutes. And uh, question one, finding this antiderivative. Both of these questions are integration by parts, like we learned about last time. So here, I'll start just by taking the 4 out, because you remember constant factors like that. It's totally OK to just pull them outside of the integrand, like that. Something you're allowed to do with derivatives or antiderivatives. And then I'll make my little table where I've got like plus, minus, plus, minus. And in my first column, I'm going to put x cube because eventually I'm going to take derivatives of x cube and that will go to zero after enough derivatives. And then the right column, I'm going to put e to the 2x and I'll take antiderivatives of e to the 2x and that's never going to go to zero, but that's okay because the derivatives of x cubed go to zero. So filling out this table, I say derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Derivative of 3x squared is 6x. Derivative of 6x is 6. And the derivative of 6 is 0. Over here, the antiderivative of e to the 2x, this is one of those antiderivative rules you would just have to memorize from section 13.1 notes. There was five antiderivative rules. This one says e to the 2x, the antiderivative should be 1 half e to the 2x. So the exponential function stays the same, but you divide by the constant that's inside the exponential function. So the antiderivative of this is going to be 1 fourth e to the 2x, and the antiderivative of this is going to be 1 eighth e to the 2x, and the antiderivative of that will be 1 16th e to the 2x. Then we're going to match these up sort of diagonally, like so. And I can stop after taking four terms, because the next term would be multiplied by a 0, so it goes to 0. Then out here, I'm going to write my 4 again, because I can't forget about that 4 I took outside of my integrand. And then my first term is going to be plus half x cubed e to the 2x. So half x cubed e to the 2x. My next term is minus 3 fourths x squared e to the 2x. So I've got that one, I've got that one. My next term is going to be plus 3 fourths, or plus 6 eighths, x e to the 2x. And then my last term here is going to be minus 6 sixteenths, so minus 3 eighths, times e to the 2x. And then don't forget the plus c. So multiplying that 4 through all these things is going to give me 2x cubed e to the 2x minus 3x squared e to the 2x plus 3x e to the 2x uh, minus 3 halves e to the 2x plus c. Stop me if you have any questions. So question two says find the antiderivative of this junk. 
And again, this is going to be an integration by parts. So I'm going to write plus minus, plus minus. This time in my first column, I'm going to write natural log of t. And then in my right column, I'll write t squared. So the derivative of natural log t is yeah, 1 over t. Um, the antiderivative of t squared would be Yep, one third t cubed. Nice. And we're going to stop right here. And I'm going to say start off with this term, sort of joined together diagonally. And then we're going to terminate this with a horizontal grouping. And the trick with the horizontal grouping is that you have to take the antiderivative of that horizontal grouping. So my first term is going to be plus one third t cube natural log t. So one third t cube natural log of t. And then what I circled in green here will become minus antiderivative of one third times one over t times t cube. And I can take the one third out, and t cubed divided by t is just t squared. Now, the antiderivative of t squared, we actually just did that, so that's going to be one third t cubed. So that makes the one third times one third a one ninth. And then don't forget the plus c. And don't forget the one third t cubed natural log t either. Okay, again, let me know if you have a question about what we did here. I got it, I got it but um, I didn't take the, it's called the... Yeah, the antiderivative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so whenever you have an uh, integration by parts question that has a natural log in there, you only ever need two rows in your table, it turns out. You can always stop after the second row. So you should always make the natural log parts the first the first column. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's important because I don't expect you to memorize what the antiderivative of natural log is. And if you had put the natural log in the third column, that means you'd be trying to take the antiderivative of natural log. So, um, yeah. OK. So we'll move on to what we have today. Our notes it says it's about Riemann sums. So uh, sums, because we're going to be adding a bunch of terms together, and Riemann is just the name of an old mathematician who lived hundreds of years ago. And so our big idea for section 13.4 is kind of different from what we've been working on. We're changing gears a little bit. This is not very much like the rest of the class. But we want to be able to calculate areas of shapes that aren't circles, and they're not triangles, and they're not rectangles, and they're not um, any sort of not any sort of regular shape with like straight edges, right? So like in, in like 10th grade, you probably learned how to do the areas of circles and how to calculate areas of any shape that has straight edges because if it has straight edges, you could break it down into triangles and then just add up the areas of the triangles and you'd be good. But if you don't have a circle and you don't have a triangle, how could you calculate the area of like this? right here, this like little shaded region in green. You know, this is what we're trying to do. The difficult part is that the top of the shaded region is a curvy, you know, curve. It's, and so you don't really have any formulas that apply here because like this section 
that's not a triangle and it's not a circle. It's something completely different. So in any case, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to find this shaded region and trying to calculate the area of this junk. So the way we're going to do this, a little five step procedure. You're going to decide on a choice of lowercase n. So this is going to be just a natural number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, whatever you want. And that's going to be the number of rectangles that we're going to divide this little area up into. We're going to line up n rectangles. So that might be like, you might be lining up seven rectangles along the x-axis. And the width of each rectangle is going to be half the width of this little area, right? So if I want to divide up this area into four rectangles, each rectangle is going to have like the same width. And I'm just going to line them up so they all are side to side across the x-axis like this with four equal widths. Then step three says I'm going to let the height of the rectangle be the function itself. And then I'm going to calculate the area of each rectangle and then add up the areas of the rectangle. And this is going to make more sense when I show you what this looks like. So on your first page of notes, this is what it would look like if I have that same curve, right? the same curve that goes up and then down and then up again. I'm trying to calculate the same area. But what if I try to calculate that area by dividing up this x-axis interval into three rectangles with equal width? I put them side to side. And the height of each of these rectangles, like how tall it is, is just going to be this red curve. So if this red curve represents some function of x, then this height here is going to be that same function represented by the red curve evaluated at negative 1. And the height of this rectangle is that same function evaluated at uh, I don't know, what does that look like? Negative 0.1-ish. And then this height is going to be that function evaluated at like 0.7. But the height of the rectangle is going to be such that the top left corner of the rectangle just meets the curve describing the top of your our little area that we want to calculate. And so it turns out that the actual area under this green curve, or sorry, the actual green shaded area right here, that area is actually 5.39. Okay, that's really what it is. If you were to add together the areas of these three rectangles, like you calculate the area of these rectangles, you do the width times the height, gives you the area of a rectangle, you do that three times, and then you add them up. That area that you would add up is 4.83. So the difference between 5.39 and 4.83 is about 0 0.56. So you have some discrepancy between what the actual area is and what the area of your rectangles are. And then whenever I say relative error, I'm saying let's divide that discrepancy by the actual area and figure out as a percent how far are we off. So we're about 10% off when we calculate the area of these three rectangles. And it should make sense that this is not exact because just visually you can see that the first rectangle is missing some area. Like there's some little white space that's not accounted for. The second rectangle is overestimating the area because there's some area in the rectangle that doesn't belong underneath the curve. And then for the third rectangle, again, we're underestimating because we've got a whole lot of area above that third rectangle underneath the curve. So these rectangles don't give a precise area value. It gives you an estimate, and we can talk about the error in the estimate, like how far is that estimate off the real thing. Well, in this case, if you just use three rectangles, you'd be 10% off of the real area. If I choose to use eight rectangles, so I divide up my x-axis interval eight ways evenly, and again, the height of each rectangle is just the value of the function at the left side of the rectangle. And I add up the area of the rectangles, I get 5.13, which is a little bit closer. So now my error, the you know, extent to which this is a bad estimate, 
the error is 5% now instead of 10%. So I went from an error of 10% to an error of 5%. So if my error is decreasing, I'm getting closer and closer to calculating the actual value. So then what if I use 20 rectangles? And just visually, you can see that those places where I'm overestimating with my rectangle, that overestimation is getting smaller. And the places where I'm underestimating the area, that underestimation is getting smaller. And so if I use 20 rectangles, my error drops to 2%. Right? And so that's not a bad estimate if you're only within 2% of your actual area. And uh, let me see if I can... show you the way I created these graphics because I'm a huge fan of like Desmos so um, <laughs> I can't remember what function I was using to uh, make those curves but this is just a different function I guess and again just to give you a different visual if you're choosing some vertical line on the left side that bounds this and some vertical line on the right side that bounds this and you say, I want to calculate the area of this really weird shape between this curve and the x-axis, right? I mean, that's not a triangle, it's not a circle, it's just a parabola on top. Like, that's a weird shape, but if you use fewer rectangles, it turns out that you are always going to have more error. So, like, two rectangles gives you an error of... 20%. But if you increase the number of rectangles and use like 30 rectangles, then your error drops to 2.5%. So basically, the more rectangles we use, the closer and closer we're getting to the actual answer. In fact, what if I bump this up from 30 rectangles to 300 rectangles? It takes it a minute to calculate, but 300 rectangles would give you an error of less than a quarter of a percent. So you're getting pretty close. And you can imagine if I did 3,000 rectangles, it might be even closer, but it might take it a really long time to calculate. So let's see. I think I might have frozen it. <laughs> so 3,000 might be too many for Desmonds. There it is. Okay, so for 3,000 rectangles, your error is less than 0.0. .0 to five percent so anyways and you can just visually see that that shape made by all these rectangles is pretty close to what the actual shape is anyways that's 30 again so i made this little table to summarize what we have as the number of rectangles increases, the relative error approaches zero. So your estimate using the areas of the rectangles goes really close to um, what the actual shape's area is. In fact, we would even say that as the number of rectangles approaches infinity, then the relative error approaches zero. And we can use limit notation to talk about this. So, You've seen the geometric picture. You've seen what you know the picture you should have in your head when we talk about what we call Riemann sums. Now we're going to do a little bit of algebra. So you know the area of each one of those rectangles is given by the height times the width. The height of the rectangle times the width gives us the area. And the width of each rectangle is given by b minus a divided by n. So what I mean by that is this vertical line on the right side is the point b. So we might say that b is 1.5. And this vertical line on the left side is going to be a, which is at uh, negative 1. I'll, I'll call it lowercase a, I'll call that my lower bound, and lowercase b, I'll call that my upper bound. So between the lower bound and the upper bound, kind of serving as like bookends on the left and the right side, I have a certain interval length. So the length of this total interval between my bounds has the length of uh, b minus a. So in our case, that would be 1.5 minus negative 1, which is 2.5. So the length of this whole interval from negative 1 up to 1.5 is 2.5 as a length. 
So then you ask, well, what would be the width of one of these eight rectangles? Well, the width would just be one eighth of the interval length. And so to get the width of a rectangle, this is going to be the interval length divided by the number of rectangles. So in our case, it would be two and a half divided by eight. And I don't really know what that is. But two and a half divided by eight is like a little bit more than a fourth. It might be like 0.29-ish. I don't know. Okay, so that's the, the width of our rectangle. Where B is my upper bound on my interval. A is the lower bound of my interval along the x-axis. And then N is obviously the number of rectangles. OK. Now, if we were to look at the third rectangle, the height of the third rectangle would be the function that describes the curve. So I have a curve, which is y as a function of x. The reason the height of the third rectangle is given by my function evaluated at b plus 2w. Oh, shoot. <laughs> That's a bad typo. That should be a. OK, let me, let me show you where to fix it. This b, that needs to be an a. And that b should be an a. And that b needs to be an a. And that b needs to be an a. OK. Because I, I meant to start from my lower bound, right? So starting from the lower bound of your interval, you add two widths of a rectangle. And that would get you to the left side of the third rectangle. You start from the lower bound. You move two widths of a rectangle to the right. That would be the point where you're at the right edge of the second rectangle, which is also the left edge of the third rectangle. So that's why I'm saying this is the formula for the height of the third rectangle. And in that case, I don't just have to think about the third rectangle. I could think about any rectangle. So if your rectangle is rectangle number j, the formula for the height would be your function evaluated at the point a plus j minus 1 times the width of each rectangle, which is b minus a over n. OK. So we want to add up all of the areas of all of the rectangles. We want to add those together. Whenever you add a bunch of stuff, one piece of math notation, I don't know if you've seen this before, is we use a capital Greek letter sigma. So that's a capital sigma. We use that to describe adding up a whole bunch of terms in what we would call a sum or a summation. So I'm saying I want to add up the area of all of the rectangles from the first rectangle to the nth rectangle, because I have n rectangles. Adding up those areas is the same thing as adding up all of the height times the widths of every rectangle. And remember, height is just this formula. And remember, the width is just this formula. Also, I want to just familiarize you with the sort of symbols that people use in calculus. So whenever we're talking about this b plus j1 times b minus a over n, which is the entire bit that falls inside this function f, we use the symbol x subscript j. So that's talking about the x-axis location of the left side of the jth rectangle. So you know, this would be x subscript 3 would be like the left, <laughs> let me say, the x-axis location of the left side of the third rectangle. OK. Then we also use the symbol delta x to represent this b minus a over n. So a lot of times this Greek letter delta, this is a capital delta. Or the lowercase 
A lowercase delta looks like this. Yeah. So, good questions. Um, a lowercase sigma looks like that. You know, this is like capital sigma, lowercase sigma, and this is capital delta, lowercase delta. Okay. Um, anyways, this is a capital Greek letter delta. And in mathematics, we use this to represent a change in. So when we talk about how delta x is b minus a over n, we're talking about the change in the position along the x-axis as you go from the first rectangle to the second rectangle to the third rectangle. The change in distance along the x-axis would be the width of the rectangle. So that's why we use this delta x. Anyways, if I make the substitutions from this summation up above here, the way it would look is the sum of my function f evaluated at each x subscript j, which is just the x location of the left side of each rectangle, times delta x, which is just the width of each rectangle. So again, this formula is still, hasn't changed at all, this is still just the sum of all the height times the widths. But I just want you to see every different way this could be written, because you'll see in that calculus textbooks it written a whole bunch of different ways. And um, what we just talked about before is that as I let the number of rectangles approach infinity, as the number of rectangles gets larger and larger and larger, the error goes to zero, which means that the sum of the areas of the rectangles approaches the actual area under the curve. So in our limit notation, you remember limits, we might say that the area under the curve is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity, the number of rectangles gets larger and larger, of this little summation where we are adding up the areas of the rectangles. This is the height times the width of each rectangle added together. I'll also point out that this would be completely equivalent if instead of taking the limit as n approaches infinity, if I told you I'm taking the limit as delta x approaches zero, it would be the same limit. Remember, delta x is the width of a rectangle. If you're reducing the width of the rectangle, that means you need more rectangles to fill up your little interval from a to b. And so that means as delta x approaches zero, the number of rectangles approaches infinity or if the number of rectangles squished in there approaches infinity, then the width of each rectangle approaches zero. So these are the same. These are equivalent ways of stating it. And then the last thing I wanna say, the last different way you might see this, is that whenever you have this limit as delta x approaches zero of a certain summation where every term in the sum is multiplied times delta x, the way that mathematicians write this is with the long, tall squiggle thing. And they'll write their lower bound A underneath the squiggle and their upper bound B above the squiggle. And then instead of writing delta X, we write DX. So DX is just the delta X as delta X approaches zero. So you can think of that Greek letter delta as being some like finite change that you can see. You can see the x value goes from like 1 to 2. That would be like a delta x. The dx means it's a change in your x variable, but it's so tiny you wouldn't be able to see it. It's like a microscopic change in your x variable. That's what we mean by the lowercase dx. It still means a change in x, but it just means a really, really tiny change in x. By the way... This might sound familiar, right? Because when we write derivatives, like if I talk about the change in, I don't know, what's a problem we've done so far this semester, the change in profit over change in time, those little lowercase d's represent a microscopic change. So it's this derivative is saying, given some microscopic change in time, like a second or a millisecond, how is your profit changing? This is the rate of change of profit over time at an exact moment. So the lowercase d's mean the same thing everywhere you see them in calculus. Anyways, um, 
Whenever we say we're going to approximate the area under the curve by adding up the areas of several rectangles, that's what we mean by a Riemann sum. A Riemann sum is the approximation or the estimate that you get from adding up the areas of rectangles. Whenever you take the exact area under the curve by taking the limit as n approaches positive infinity and delta x approaches 0, that's what we're going to call a definite integral. So definite integrals are what you take in the limit. By the way, this is how calculators work. So let me show you something really quick. I'm going to show you this uh, parabola, which is half x squared plus 1. I'll use a lower bound of 0 and an upper bound of 1. And we'll use like 10 rectangles. And it tells me that the actual area is 1.16666667. Let's use a calculator. And in my little calculator, I'm going to go to, you can do this yourself. You have a TI-84 right sitting right in front of you, or most of you do. I'll get you one, Chris. There should be a button somewhere in this calculator, if I can find it, that will do uh, what we call numerical integration. And numerical integration is just a fancy word for taking a Riemann sum with really little rectangles. So that's going to be under math, maybe? It might take me a while to find this. Yeah, so if you go to math and then number 9, number 9 says F-N-I-N-T. So F stands for function, N stands for numerical, INT stands for integration. So this is saying numerical integration. If I choose that, it's going to want me to put in a lower bound, like 0, and an upper bound, like 1. It wants me to put in a function, which we'll put in 0.5 times x to the power 2 plus 1. Yeah, that's my function. And then where it says d blank, I want to integrate with respect to x. So this is going to be my definite integral, and I click enter, and it gives me the same answer as I got before on Desmos for the actual area. But what's happening inside your calculator? The way your calculator comes up with this particular area, 1.16 repeating, is what your calculator does is it says, OK, we're going to try 10 rectangles. And it calculates that area. And then it says, I'm going to try then 100 rectangles. And we'll calculate that area. And it says, well, my Riemann sum changed between 1 and 100. So maybe I need to refine this a little bit more. And then I put in 1,000. And it's going to take it a long time to calculate this. Because it's basically just written in the graphics. And then it says, OK, it changed, but not that much. And then your calculator continues to increase the number of rectangles from like 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 until it notices that the Riemann sums don't really change by that much, right? Because at some point, your approximation is so good, it barely has anything left to refine. And so your calculator says at a certain point, OK, this answer is good enough. And then it tells you, you know, the Riemann sum. So your calculator, whenever you tell it to numerically integrate to find these types of areas, it actually uses this Riemann sum algorithm actually calculating the area of a bunch of rectangles and adding them together. It just does so like behind the scenes. OK. So this is the way that I might, well, I should say, this is the way that I will test you over this on your next exam. I'm going to give you one or more problems that look like this. It says, 
Estimate the area under the curve given by this function f of x between lower bound a equals 0 and upper bound b equals 3 using two rectangles, four rectangles, and eight rectangles. So let's draw a little picture. Um, I've got my xy plane and the graph x squared plus 1 well when x is 0 my function is 1 when x is 1 my function is 2 when x is 2 my function is 5 so it goes up quite a bit after that it's this nice parabola curve and it continues on the other side, I guess. I could continue drawing it. Okay. So this is the curve y equals f of x. And what we're trying to figure out is what would be my area under the curve between points 0 and 3 if I estimate it using like two rectangles. So using two rectangles means I have a rectangle width of what? What should the width be along the x-axis? Yep, 1.5. Yeah. So the length of my interval b minus a is 3. And so the width of two rectangles, each rectangle would have to have width 1.5. So my first rectangle is going to look like this. The height of the rectangle is just enough so that the left side of the rectangle touches your curve. The top is flat, the bottom is flat, it has width 1.5. The second rectangle, its height is going to go up so that the left side just barely touches the curve, and then it's flat on the top because it's a rectangle. And again, the width is 1.5, and then the height would be whatever my function is when I evaluate it at the point x equals 1.5. So that would be 3.25 for a height. And this one has width 1.5 and height 1. So approximating with two rectangles, that would give me an area of 1 times 1.5 plus uh, 3.25 times 1.5 and this is why I handed you calculators today <laughs> somebody tell me what's like 1.5 plus 3.25 times 1.5 6.375 okay thank you 6.375 nice so approximating this area under the curve with two rectangles would give me an area of 6.375. Okay. Uh, now, I want to approximate this area with four rectangles. If I use four rectangles, what should the width of my rectangle be? Point seven five. Yep. It should be half of half of 3, or you could say, well, my interval length is uh, b minus a, and I need to divide that by my number of rectangles, so my width should be 3 minus 0 divided by 4, which is 0 0.75. Now, for my four rectangles, the height of the rectangle is going to be the function evaluated at the left side. So the left side of my first rectangle is going to be x equals 0. The left side of my second rectangle would be 0 0.75, because I'm adding one width of a rectangle. The left side of my third rectangle would happen at 1.5, and the left side of my fourth rectangle would happen at 2.25. So each time I just added the width of a rectangle, and this is going to be the heights of my four rectangles. So evaluating my function at 0, we got 0 squared plus 1 is 1. Evaluating my function at uh, 1.5 tells me that 
1.5 squared plus 1 is 3.25. Someone tell me, evaluating this function at the point 0 0.75, that should be 0 0.75 squared plus 1, and I need someone to help me with that number. And I also need someone to punch in what is 2.25 squared plus 1. One point five six two five. Okay. Thank you. So the two point two five is a six point zero six two five. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So these are the heights of my four rectangles. One, one point five six two five, three point two five, six point zero six two five. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to add up all the height times the width. So I want to add up 1 times 0 0.5, sorry, 0 0.75, height times width, plus the second rectangle's area would be 1.5625 times 0 0.75, height times width, plus 3.25 times 0 0.75. Finally, adding the fourth rectangle's area is plus 6.0625, times 0 0.75. And you might notice that in this sum, each of my terms has a 0 0.75. So we can factor out that 0 0.75, and this is going to be 0 0.75 times 1 plus 1.5625 plus 3.25 plus 6.0625. So you can actually add up the heights of the rectangles first and then multiply times the width because every rectangle has the same width. You can think of this as the width times height one plus height two plus height three plus height four. Okay. So what, what do you get when you add up all of those heights and then multiply by 0.75? Ten point three two three. Did you also multiply by the point seven five? Okay, so you would have to put these uh, four numbers in parentheses, or the other way you can do it on the calculator is you can just add up the four numbers and press enter, and then type times point seven five and press enter again. But the way you put it in, it was only multiplying the very last number by 0.75. So the area is 8.90625. That sounds about right. And Clarissa, you, you, you added up the numbers first and then. Yeah, put them in parentheses and then just multiply the numbers. Okay, yeah. Yeah, your calculator is really picky about order of operations. So if you see parentheses in a math problem, you've got to put the parentheses in the calculator. Otherwise, it'll, it'll definitely screw you over on an exam. Okay, so that was for n is equal to 4. And so my first guess for two rectangles was 6.375. When I boosted that to four rectangles, I got 8.9. So that was a big difference. That kind of is an indication to me that I don't have a really good approximation yet. If I had a really great approximation, then increasing the number of rectangles shouldn't change the area by that much because you should be really zeroing in on the exact answer. So we're not there yet. We might, again, try n is equal to 8, and that's probably the largest number I'm going to ask you to do. Because for n is equal to 8, we're going to add up the height of 8 rectangles and then multiply that by the width. 
My width is gonna be again b minus a divided by n, so that's gonna be three minus zero divided by eight. And that should be 0 0.75 divided by two, gives me 0 0.375. So there's my width when I have eight rectangles. The height of these eight rectangles is gonna be my function evaluated at zero, my function evaluated at 0 0.375, my function evaluated at the point 0 0.75, and then whatever 0 0.75 plus 0 0.375 is, I don't know. Uh, and then 1.5. And then 1.875, and then 2.25, and then I don't really know about that one. And then that should be my eight heights. What should someone with a calculator tell me? What should be the height of my fourth rectangle? It should be the function evaluated at what point? Yeah, that sounds right. And then this would be 2.625. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So those are my eight heights of the rectangle. And my area of my entire Riemann sum here is going to be my width times the height of the first one plus the height of the second one plus the height of the third one plus the height of the fourth one, plus the height of the fifth one, plus the height of the sixth one, plus the height of the seventh one, plus the height of the eighth one, and don't forget the parentheses around all of those heights. But this is gonna be 0 0.375 times, and I actually know the heights of all the odd numbered rectangles already because I just did this for my four rectangle case. So those heights of my first one should be one plus something plus the height of the third one should be 1.5625. I'm just looking at what we did earlier. Plus the height of my fourth one plus the height of my fifth one should be 3.25 plus the height of my sixth one plus the height of my seventh one should be 6.25. 06 plus the height of my eighth one. I just don't know the height of my second, fourth, sixth, or eighth ones because those are brand new. So for the second one, you'd have to do 0 0.375 squared plus one. One 1.375. 1.375? Really? Plus one. Uh, squared plus one. I need, uh, yeah, I need. Uh, my, my function is x squared plus 1. So whatever your input is, squared plus 1. So 0 0.375 squared plus 1. Okay, 1.14, good enough. What about 1.125 squared plus 1? 2.26. Okay, what about 1.875 squared plus 1? 4.5. Okay, then uh, 2.625 squared plus 1. 7.89. Okay. So then add up these heights inside the parentheses and then multiply by my width, 0.375. And that should get us an area that should be a little bit larger than nine, I think.
So I cheated. I just did it with my Desmos calculator that I built. And it's telling me that my room on sum, after I add together all eight of these rectangles, it should be 10.4. 10.4. Now the actual area under the curve is 12. So if you continued to add more and more and more and more rectangles, you would fill in more of this gap in between the top of the rectangle and the curve with your additional rectangles. And so you're going to get closer and closer to your actual area of 12. If this feels like it's really tedious, like it takes a long time to answer a simple question about, air, about area, it should. It's just like, um, just like I always say about like the course linear algebra, is like the purpose of linear algebra is because that's how computers do math. Like computers perform math calculations and solve systems of equations by manipulating matrices. Students in a linear algebra course would still have to manipulate matrices by hand because you're trying to understand how the computers do it. You're trying to understand what's happening when you ask a computer to do it. So this section in our textbook is pretty much like that, right? It should feel really tedious and boring for you to sit and calculate Riemann sums by hand, but the purpose of the students doing it by hand is so that you can understand what's happening whenever your calculator or a computer calculates an area, right, or calculates one of these definite integrals for you. And so you just know what's happening. You're not just completely oblivious to the idea, but you know that your calculator is adding up a bunch of little rectangle areas for you. It's a lot faster when the calculator does it. So on this calculator, on the TI-84, what we could do is we could go to math, and then we could go to number nine, which is numerical integration. And then we would say my lower bound is zero, my upper bound is three, and I'm integrating uh, x squared plus one with respect to x. And like I said, the exact answer is 12. What your calculator is really doing, though, is um, adding up more and more and more rectangles until that answer quits changing so much, right? Like, at a certain point in the iteration of this problem, your calculator calculates an answer that's like what we got. It might first arrive at the answer 6.375, and then arrive at the answer 8.9 and say, hey, that was a big jump. I should probably keep refining my answer. And then it gets the answer 10.4. And then it says, well, that was still a pretty big jump from 8.9 to 10.4, so maybe we should continue to add rectangles. And your calculator just adds more and more and more rectangles until your calculator would eventually get an answer like 11.9999999. And then at a certain point, your calculator just says, screw it, we're going to round up to 12, call it a day. <laughs> right? Uh, and that's how your calculator is able to tell you that the area is 12. All right, so there's a couple more practice problems on the notes that you might look at before your next exam. I'll give you a quiz next time that's just calculating every month, something like this. Do y'all have any questions? Okay. All right, well, y'all have a great day. Have a great weekend.